Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 121, the creative-led PhD. Ooh. Now I pondered a lot about the title of this vlog. I don't like creative-led, I don't think it's accurate, we'll get into why it's accurate and problematic in a sec, but we could also refer to this mode of research as practice-led research or the artefact and exegesis thesis. And actually I think the last one is the most accurate and perhaps the most useful. Because I think the word creative gets us into a fair amount of trouble. Because there are a lot of differences between creativity and research. And I think we really need to understand that the PhD is a research qualification, configuring an original contribution to knowledge, whatever the mode of scholarship you may enact. So sometimes the word creative gets in the way of thinking about and thinking through the research. It is also used, I think, to justify a series of behaviours that can be the very antithesis of research and scholarship. Ooh, provocative. Now, I supervise an array of these creative-led theses, performance, creative arts, design, creative writing, sonic media in particular I do a lot of work in, and also screen-based media. But what makes this mode of doctorate deeply problematic, and there are lots of problematic bits of it, but one of the big problems, the reason we are doing this vlog, in fact, is because of the high number of split decisions, or what they call divergent results. So what that means is two examiners are looking at this creative-led thesis, and the results come back an A and a D, an A and an E, or an A and an F. So what exactly does that mean, Tara? Well, let me tell you. That means that one examiner's gone A straight through, thanks for playing, boom, while the other examiner has gone D, major rewriting and restructuring, or E, this is a Masters of Philosophy, or F, mm -hmm, this would be a fail. So we don't see the scale of these divergent results in any other mode of thesis as much as we do in the creative world thesis. And what I'm gonna do in the vlog today is do some really quick and dirty tips because these issues and problems are really easy to fix. And I think it's the nature of the creative led thesis and the theorization and the methodology that's around it a very small number of people write a great deal on methodology and theory in this area and everybody refers to the same three or four names and those three or four names now wrote a fair amount of time ago so the deep critique that comes from interdisciplinarity has not yet hit the creative-led thesis. So that's creating all sorts of problems and it just means relatively dated ideas are being repeated time and time again, generation after generation after generation. I also really want to widen out this discussion far beyond the creative arts. Most of you know I've based a lot of my critique in my entire career on problematizing the notion of high culture, problematizing the notion of cultural value, that some texts just have intrinsic worth while others do not. Well, that's absolute nonsense. Post, 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 post structuralism. That's absolute nonsense. It was nonsense in 1982. It's nonsense in 2018. There is nothing intrinsically in a text that renders it of quality. So it's very, very important that we just problematize the notion of, oh yes, something is creative, therefore it has value not. And also my argument today is the artifact and exegesis thesis has much more currency and interest for a diversity of disciplines far beyond the creative arts. So at Flinders right now, we have two wonderful students in speech pathology who are using the artifact exegesis methodology, remembering it's a methodology, to understand and create new knowledge in speech pathology. So I think in the allied health professions, particularly new health studies areas, the artifact and exegesis will be incredibly useful. Okay, so let's just start with the what, hey. So what is the artifact and exegesis thesis? 
and then we'll look at why there are split decisions and how we fix it. So really, really straightforward vlog today. So the artifact and exegesis thesis is composed of two parts that makes it incredibly unusual. So two components are submitted to examiners. What are those two components? Well, let me tell you. One of the components is the artifact the object right and that object can be analog or digital it can be sonic or it can be visual or it can indeed be a mixed media installation of some form so that's one part of it the artifact the exegesis then we have that word i've used a lot already that some of you may be questioning what exactly it means and that is it is the exegesis from the greek meaning explanation. Now this is really important. In this mode of thesis, this is between 30 and 40,000 words in length. Okay, so we're going to talk about the exegesis shortly and what goes wrong in this mode of thesis and how to make it right. Because can I say, almost all the things that go wrong in the artifact exegesis thesis go wrong in the exegesis, not the artifact. So the object is okay. The fails and the problems come in through the exegesis. Okay, so the artifact can be in written form, so it can be a novel, novella, poetry or script. Design can be obviously architecture, graphic design, interior design, but also furniture design. The sonic is sonic architecture, sonic art, could also be popular music. I've supervised a lot of PhDs that have a popular music artifact and also podcasting. I would love to supervise a thesis using podcasting as the artifact, yet to happen. And then of course the visual suite, so fine art, film, screen arts, mixed method screen based environments. So the diversity of these artifacts, as you can see, is staggering, important and truly fabulous. And I really think we need to be pushing the boundaries of the diversity of what we're doing in the artifact exegesis component. But there is a reason why I am in the beautiful Lake District. And yes, you know, it's a very, very early Saturday morning and people are desperate to get there, bless. Uh, so I'm in Ambleside, of course, the home of Wordsworth and there is a reason why I'm in this truly beautiful location because it makes us think about because obviously Wordsworth was seen to be a very poor poet it was very you know very simple poetry not really terribly important or relevant and that's why the notion of quality I'm really taking on today particularly when we actually are dealing with research so the the complex questions I want to ask you today are why this mode of research exists. And I want to be provocative because why are you using this mode of research, this method in research and not any other? And there is a reason. And uh, when I teach creative-led, practice-led, artifact exegesis topics, whether it was to undergraduates or to master's students, I used to use an analogy, a metaphor, which I hope you might find useful today. So why do we do this? Why do we use this mode of research? Now, my pr provocation is always only use creative-led research methods when no other option is available to you. So that means conventional research can only take you so far on particular topics. So you need to make a leap. You need to make a jump beyond what conventional methods can get you to. So beyond the logical next step of research, beyond what accumulated knowledge can give you. So that means you've done your literature review, you know where knowledge is at, you've got some nice research questions in place, and you've got a good sense of the limitations of knowledge. Right, so at this point, how do you create an original contribution to knowledge? And the answer to that is the artifact moves you ahead of the research. This is really important, I'll repeat that. So here is where the research sort of stops. How do you go to the next stage? And the answer is via the artifact. The artifact moves you forward. So when I teach this stuff, I always describe the artifact as being like a stone that you throw into a pond, okay? So existing knowledge gets you to the edge of the water, gets you to the shoreline, okay? So that's your literature review. That's where existing knowledge is. But to get one more step further, you've got to do something unusual. 
and I refer this, refer to this as putting a stone, throwing a stone into a pond. So you're moving knowledge ahead by the artifact. You're throwing a stone into a pond. So now I'm going to do something. I'm actually going to get a stone. Here's one I prepared earlier and throw it into the beautiful Windermere behind me. Now, unfortunately, my father said I used to throw like a girl. Um, so I'm going to throw like a girl and just see if I can get it in the water. It shouldn't be too difficult, but I'm actually now going to throw a stone into the water to show you what the artifact actually does. So here we go, Kevin. Okay, stone in water. Oh, look, I can do that. Even a girl can do that. Come on. Boom! That was brilliant. I'm just going to do that again because that was so much fun. Okay, I did have a spare just in case I buggered it up. Okay, here we go. Wicked. So, guys, that's the point of what an artifact is meant to do. It just takes you further than where the existing knowledge is. Okay, so that's what the artifact does. It's that stone in a pond. But what the exegesis must do is then write the connection from the shoreline to where the stone landed. So the exegesis takes you from the existing knowledge to what the object, the artifact, has revealed. You got it? Now that's the key relationship. You get that right, you're winning. You're not going to have any problems. So as you can see, this is a surprising, volatile and very exciting mode of research. A lot of really great things can happen in this mode of research. And I think it's really been undercooked and under theorized. We're not using its splendidness as much as we should. But we also, of course, have to ensure the rigors of scholarship. We have to confirm accountability, repeatability, and transferability, right? Now, the problem with this mode of research, and you've got to call a spade a shovel here, the problem with this mode of research is it's not repeatable. So one of the characteristics of high quality research is that the research is repeatable. In this case, that's one of the weaknesses, but it can be talked through in the exegesis. If we lose repeatability, what do we gain through innovation and originality? So think about that. The assumption, though, I think, too often, is that the artifact is simply creative and quality and can stand on its own terms. And as you can see, it's just simply not. It is that stone thrown into a pond. An object is just an object unless you put the research and the framing and the scholarship around it. You have to prove the original contribution to knowledge, research, rather than assume that the artifact has any intrinsic worth, because it doesn't. An artifact means nothing in itself. And that's why students get themselves into so much trouble in this mode of doctorate, because they spend, and I'm just going to do the narrative I've seen hundreds of times, they spend three years making a film, three months writing the exegesis, the exegesis retells the story of the film, puts in the plot and characterization without any theorization of narratives, and no totter of, no prop. It's just basically retelling the tale. So it's a nightmare, and that is how you fail this mode of thesis. And of course, that's also why you see such big splits in this mode of doctorate as well. So I want to be really clear here, and sorry to be so out there, but you know, I've seen so many people's lives destroyed by not taking this key truth. A film is just a film. It's not research. A sonic artifact is just a sonic artifact. It's not research. A novel is just a novel. It's not research. If you want to make a film, if you want to write a novel, if you want to do some design, that is terrific. Brilliant, fantastic, knock yourself out. Don't assume that there's a PhD there. It's different. So I'm being hard because I've seen student after student, generation after generation of students really make errors in this mode of doctorate because they're assuming that an object has intrinsic value and they're confusing the fact that, okay, it might be interesting and have value, but it doesn't mean that it's research. So you are trying to research and configure an original contribution to knowledge. Therefore, the object, the artifact, the stone that you've thrown into the pond moves debates forward and then the exegesis proves and puts the research into that jump. You got it? If you've got that, we're winning. And that's why I think words like art and creativity really obstruct 
a proper conversation that we need to be having about this methodology. There is no intrinsic quality. There is no intrinsic quality. Those debates are over. They've been over for a hundred years. And you know what, even if there was, even if in your mind you think there is quality art, that's great, but even if there is, it doesn't mean that there's research in it. So you might make a quality film, that's great, but it doesn't mean it has anything to do at all with a PhD. Therefore, you need to justify your method or put another way, you need to show that this was the only way that you could move knowledge forward, that all the other modes of doing a PhD would not get you to this outcome. So in many ways, the artifact exegesis PhD is the meta PhD, the PhD that reflects on the nature of doing a PhD. So I'm now going to just do the quick, really five quick tips to stop these divergent decisions. Really, really be clear about how we fix the problems in this mode of thesis. Wow, that was a bust. One, crucial, be very clear about the limitations around your object. So what is your object? Explain the boundaries around it. So what is your object? Be clear of the genre of this object and its function, its role in your thesis. In the exegesis, explain the nature of the artifact. Be clear and you will have to justify why you chose this particular mode platform or interface. Why have you chosen this and not another medium? Also be singular in the definition. If you hear nothing else in the gig today, this could change your life and stop the divergent result. A really shocking divergent result that I saw in this mode was an A and an F, a straight through and yes, a fail. And it was a performance-based thesis, a drama-based thesis. What happened? The student videoed the performance and that video was sent to the examiner. What was the problem? The examiner thought they were examining the video rather than the performance, and the video was simply a static camera put in front of a stage. So the examiner went, well, this was a really poor video. I can't really see what I'm meant to be examining here. Fail. So for our performance-based colleagues out there, team, if the examiner is assessing the performance, then render it a live performance. Put the examiner in front of a live performance. I've a lot. I've supervised and examined a lot of these in the UK here, but also in Australia. And team, you really need to see the performance. So if you need the examiner to understand the theorisation performance, and there's some very complex theorisations performance at the moment, then put them in the audience. Don't give them a video and hope for the best. So be very clear about what is the object, what is being assessed. Cool. Two, don't confuse research and art. Don't confuse research and art. This is critical. Don't assume for one moment that the examiner is remotely interested in your art. The artifact and exegesis is being assessed as research, an original contribution to knowledge, not to art, to knowledge. So whether or not it's art or not, whether or not it's quality or not, is actually irrelevant. So tell me about the research. Don't tell me about the art. And that's why we use the word artifact, by the way, not art, artifact. Three, crucial. Examiners read the exegesis before they read the artifact. So the greatest mistake that students make is they assume that the examiner is absolutely thrilled and excited when they open up the thesis and wow, there's a novel there, wow, there's a film there, wow, there's a sonic artifact there, wow, there's some design drawings and wow, I'm going to be really excited about that and I'm going to spend the next five days just immersed in that creative experience. That would be wrong. Examiners read the exegesis first so they understand what is occurring with the research. So the exegesis frames what they're going to understand and evaluate in the artefact. So they require a frame, they need to understand the research that is around the artefact. So never assume that the artefact is self-standing in any way. In fact, one of our wonderful students, hi Tracy, Tracy sent me an email saying, what's the waiting? for examiners of the two components of the thesis. So assuming it's like an undergraduate essay that, oh yes, well the artefact's worth 60% and the exegesis is worth 40%. Actually, no, they're both assessed as a whole, as a connected entity, 
uh, and there's no weighting, what actually happens is the exegesis frames the artefact. Okay, so they're interested in how the artefact moves forward knowledge, but they need that proven by the exegesis, which they read first. Now, if they just simply see the artefact and there's not enough energy in the exegesis to explain the research, that's how you fail. Okay, four. Wow, these are important ones. <laughs> I'd forgotten how important these were. Um, focus on the why rather than the how. Focus on the why rather than the how. So the problematic exegeses, and we see a lot of them, particularly in novels and creative writing, is that they focus on the how, how the book was written. So they retell the narrative, they retell and talk about the characters without any theorization at all. So please remember that creative-led research is a method. Don't do any literal or realist configurations of, you know, how you did it. How is easy, why is hard? And so what we want to see is why this artifact exists in the form that it does, why you made a selection of that modality and the theorization that went into it. Don't tell me how the book was written. I'm reading the book. Tell me why the book was written. Why, the why matters. Five, ensure the connection between the artifact and the exegesis is avert. Now, this is the only mode of thesis that we have where two bits are sent to examiners. So the key rub here is to connect the bits. <laughs> How do you connect the artifact and the exegesis? Because when you've got two disparate parts, if you haven't got a strategy to link or mix them together to show the relationship, the people will just go, well, how do these bits actually work together? And the point is that ambiguity, that liminality, leaves space for those divergent results. So really overtly explain to the examiners how they're going to link these two parts together. You can't be too overt. In this mode of PhD, you are explaining to the examiner how they are to assess your work. So hopefully with these five tips, we'll reduce the split decisions, we'll also reduce the divergent results and ensure that this truly wonderful way of doing research, the artifact and exegesis research, the artifact and exegesis mode, really flowers through the remainder of the 21st century. This can be big. At the moment, it's a very small part of what we do in the PhD. But this is a method is interesting, really provocative, really powerful. And if we can get away from notions of high culture, high art and quality, and look at the research, the exciting, passionate research that emerges from this method, then wow, we've got a lot of stuff going on here. So thank you for joining me at the beautiful Lake District. How beautiful is Ambleside? A bit noisy, but I I tell you what again, worth it, I hope. So a big hello, big hi to everyone, and I wish you love, light, and peace. Tea out.